My first instrument was the piano. Always been the piano. And it's embarrassing. My mom has a picture of me at less than a year old in my diapers. Apparently, when I was still, uh, I know that sounds terrible. <laughs> Just it's so, so uh, precocious. Um, uh, but but she says that. There was a neighbor that had, my parents didn't have a piano, but neighbor had a piano and we were over there a lot and whenever anybody would play it, I would crawl over up to, I would crawl over toward it and paw at it or whatever. And uh, as soon as I could sit up without falling over, they stuck me up on the bench one day and they took a picture. So sort of a fluke really, I was not, you know. But, but uh, my grandmother bought us a bad upright, which unfortunately is still sitting in my mother's living room in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, when I was about four and a half, five, and started lessons shortly after that. Piano group, and then quickly moved into private lessons, and that's just kind of what I've always done. There are definitely some specific teachers and mentor figures. I always mention first, I sort of believe that if you can, well, this is, this is subjective. If you can have a mentor like I had, and have the type of relationship that I had, then you probably will resonate with the concept that uh, you, you only really have one true mentor. You may have mentor figures, and there may be many of them. God bless, as many as you can, as fine. But uh, my, my true mentor was a Sicilian composer of avant-garde 20th century music named Salvatore Martirano, who was at the University of Illinois as a composition professor for many, many, many years. Um, he put his way through college playing bebop piano, but, and he played to the end of his life. Um, a rambunctious, boisterous, barbarous, uh, uh, but highly elegant at the same time, uh, piano style. And he was one of the most brilliant musicians I've ever known or known about. I mean, he just happened to be into the very avant-garde 20th century stuff. He invented one of the first synthesizers. It was like, looked like a phone switchboard with all the wires coming out of it. And uh, we actually got close after I left school. And it was, uh, it was just hanging, hanging, learning about music, hanging at his place with other guys till six in the morning, you know, drinking, listening to music. I mean, I'm, I don't, it, it, it was a whole different time back then. There was a different level of responsibility, you know, and, uh, trust at the same time, and uh, it, we, we had no idea what we had. I have friends still, obviously, that were part of that scene, and we just thought that the kind of situation that we had was normal. It was really quite extraordinary. Urbana Champagne, I'm talking about through the 70s and, you know, well into the 80s, that's, that's when we were there, and Sal was one of the linchpins of that. Um, two other mentors that I really like to mention, one of them was the great John Garvey, who's a familiar name to some people, was the director of the jazz bands at U of I for many, many years. True musical guru. Uh, himself actually a classical violist, not a jazz instrumentalist. His brother was Leontina Price's accompanist for decades. Uh, Frank Garvey, I think? I might be wrong about that, but uh, John was an amazing, amazing teacher. Um, amazing ensemble realizer of vision. Um, uh, and then the other one is I was fortunate enough to study classically with a guy who still is at U of I named Ian Hobson, who is really one of the most amazing, uh, he's British, he still is one of the most amazing class. I mean, this guy, the library he keeps in his head from the classical, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I should say classical impressionist, Baroque, Romantic, uh, uh, even modern era. I mean, the stuff that he can play without even looking at music, it, it's, he's ridiculous. And the great thing about studying with him is that, it, with all due respect, once I started studying with him, I realized that all the other piano teachers I'd had, the well-meaning, taught me how to play pieces. And Ian was teaching me how to play the piano. It was a whole physical system. It was an approach I'd never encountered before. And I was fortunate enough not to be carrying too many bad habits into the experience so that I was actually able to respond to his uh, teaching. So those were the main ones. Yes, I do. And it was well before any of that. Um, I was in the rock band in grade school in Dallas, Texas. 
and the guitar player, Randy Rackley, could also play a little drums. And there was a little bar called Ferguson's Landing, a little hole-in-the-wall dive bar in the local sort of strip shopping, the same place where my mom bought her groceries, and kind of around the corner was this little Ferguson's Landing, and we just stumbled onto it because we were looking through the windows, and we were about, you know, 13 maybe, and we saw that there was a piano and a drum set in there. And we were like, you know, we should just go in there and play. Without a bass player, I mean, he would just keep the beat, and I knew all these different songs, you know, not jazz, pop songs and popular songs. And what we didn't know was that it was a place where uh, elder uh, and mostly, I think, probably uh, fairly far gone into alcoholism, union music, Dallas music union guys hung out in this place. So I really do think of it as my, because we, we would go there and we'd go in and all oh, the kids are here, you know, and we would sit there and play Beatles tunes and Carpenter's tunes and Blood, Sweat and Tears, whatever I worked up and Randy just played the drums and we would walk out of there usually with between 15 and 20 bucks, which in 1973, you know, two 13 year old kids, that was a lot of money, man. I could like keep you from getting a paper route if you could do that fairly frequently. So that was my first gig, first paid gig.